And this is the Aztec diamond of size four, since it has like four vertices here on the side. Um, and well, as you all know, we are interested in like diamond covering of this one, right? <coughs> Sorry, a diamond covering, which, well, you know, we try to just cover all, all the, vert the vertices with, with some uh, choice of, uh, of edges and that produce a diamond covering. Did I fail? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's a, it's a play a game you play, and hopefully you're lucky. Sometimes you're unlucky, and uh, you know. It's the wrong way to sample. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, you know the deal. What you're supposed to do. Uh, this is not the not the right one. Um. And. Um, and uh, as I said, we are interested in what happens when this uh, graph tends to in infinity or, or when the lattice, uh, lattice, uh, 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 lattice uh, uh, goes to zero. Uh, and what happens, I think we have seen a number of these uh, like random simulations, right? So the, 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 the Aztec diamond converges to this, uh, to this uh, diamond here and we see this Arctic surf, er, circle appearing. Uh, so I will. So what I will do now is to discuss what happens if you zoom in at some point and look at the local fluctuation around such a point. Okay. And to do that, I will first discuss what is the what is the so when we zoom in at one point we like in the limit we will see some some measure on the square lattice right on the entire plane and i will first discuss the measures that we expect to see as we zoom in here and the measures we expect to see are the ergodic translation invariant gibbs measure ergodic or for short, if I will write it again, E, T, I, G. So these are measures which, which lives on the, on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on the square lattice. And so let me write this, or let me um, draw this. So in this talk for I don't know, for due to some convention I've been used to, I will rotate the square lattice. So I will think about the square lattice rotated by uh, 45 degrees. And if you don't like this, uh, which I know some people don't, you can, you know, just tilt your head throughout the... the Tutorial and you will be fine. Okay, and then you know this this continues here uh, everywhere. And I will I will uh, also label these uh, these uh, black and white vertices uh, simply by starting somewhere and uh, call the black ver vertex here. B0, 0, 0. Here, I think I go upwards, right? Um, yeah. Uh, 0, 1, black 0, 2, black 0, 3. And when I continue in this direction, I will have black 1, 0. And here, black 1, 1, black 1, 2, and so on. And similarly, I will uh, have white vertices, so I call this 0, 0, so you just label it as the black vertex, uh, just uh, down to the left of it. Uh, 
Okay, so this is the square lattice. And on this uh, square lattice, I define uh, a, a weight function, or we introduce some weight function, which I denote by nu. So this is a function from the edges to the positive, uh, pos uh, positive real numbers. Um, and we call these, so uh, we call these, so these numbers, so for each edge, we call this number the edge weights. Okay. And for this talk, I will be interested in the case when this weight function is periodic. Okay, so I want I want the periodicity to be so if you have an edge e uh, I mean you write e as a, uh, as an edge as uh, the uh, uh, the vertices it connected uh, connects then we have that b i plus k1, uh, comma j plus k2, uh, the white vertex uh, i plus k1, comma j plus k2, should be equal to, uh, if you simply remove this, uh, this k1 and k2. for all i, j. So here, this is only the edge, these types of edge, but this should be true for all types of edge. So the periodicity in k1 and k2 uh, is the periodicity. Okay? So we have simply a periodic uh, graph, right? Okay, so the, uh, the, uh, tra the ergodic translation invariant Gibbs measures are, uh, are, uh, um, are um, probability measures on uh, Daimler configuration on the entire plane, and they fulfill a few uh, properties, so three properties. So one, the properties. So one is the Gibbs property. Yeah, well, all properties are in the name, but yeah. The Gibbs property, which simply says that if you take a region, uh, a region of a uh, uh, bounded region of, uh, of the square lattice, so a region R, and you consider the probability measure on Daimler configuration, con um, uh, and you uh, uh, condition on the complement of R, then this, this measure is proportional to, uh, uh, you know, the, the, proportional to the product of, uh, of all edge weights in your Daimler configuration. So simply if you have like, uh, uh, so if you have like, um, you, you have a Daimler configuration, you take away some piece of it, and then you sample on this piece, this should have, uh, this, should, this probability should be uh, proportional to this one. Uh, it should be translation invariant. And that simply means that if you have, if you look at some part of your graph and look what is the configuration here, it should be the same as if you look some, p, uh, some 
distance away to the uh, if you translate uh, translate that part uh, somewhere in the graph, and that should not change the probability. And then it should be ergodic. which means that you cannot decom de decompose this, uh, uh, this probability measure as a, um, as a convex uh, combination of other translation invariant Gibbs measures. So, uh, so if your probability measure uh, is equal to S P1 plus 1 minus S P2, where where P1 and P2 are also Gibbs, uh, Gibbs tr translation invariant Gibbs measure, then that implies that S is equal to 0 or 1. So that's the Gibbs property. And it's kind of, you know, natural, maybe not obvious, or it's, it is not obvious, but um, so that these three properties should hold, you know, if you look at the, the first property, this is a property which hold already for, on the, uh, for finite graphs, which means that when you take the limit, you should expect to have this, still have that property, right? Uh, the translation invariant property, you can think about some, some continuity uh, some continuity of the model because if you zoom in, in at the point here and then you zoom uh, and if you compare with if you go a finite uh, step in in some direction you should not expect to see something different right if you, if you only move uh, like a finite step and that that is kind of captured here in the translation invariant Okay, and uh, to be honest, I'm not completely sure why one expects this, uh, this uh, ergodic property, but yeah, that's, that's there. Okay, and, and uh, these measures, they have been, it turns out that, no, uh, these measures have been uh, 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 characterized, I think, almost 20 years ago now, by Kenyon, Konkov, and Sheffield. Okay, so um, so this is a theorem. So it's from Kenyon, Konkov, and Sheffield. Um, so if if uh, if you have, uh, um, so maybe I should say, so basically what they prove here is uh, a similar uh, statement that Cedric told us about finite graphs, namely that if you look at, at um, um, local correlations or correlations between different dimers, then you can express this in terms of inverse, uh, the inverse of the Castling matrix. And this is a similar statement, as you will show, but with some subtleties. So uh, first, what is the, just a reminder, what is the Castling matrix here? So for, uh, uh, for an edge E, uh, the Castling matrix is, I denote it KG because there will be more than one Castling matrix here, and G is the graph, the entire graph over here, right? Um, so uh, the Castling matrix um, of WB is equal to uh, sigma of E times nu of E, where nu is this weight function. And sigma, if you remember from, uh, from Cedric's talk, um, a sigma is this sign, uh, the Castling sign he talked about, which makes sure that, um, um, uh, that um, uh, the partition function uh, becomes a determinant. 
Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know what I'm writing here for E. Uh, Uh, okay, so the uh, ergodic translation invariant Gibbs measures are parameterized by x, y in R2 uh, and are given by the probability of x, y at, at the probability that uh, vi, wi are in a Dime configuration for i is equal to 1 to p, let's say. Uh, this is equal, and I think you were, uh, hopefully you recognize this formula, is equal to the product of i goes from 1 to p of the Kastlin matrix evaluated at w i, uh, b i, and then you have a determinant of the inverse one, Okay, so, so this is, as you, if you remember from, from the talk yesterday, uh, this is the same formula, kind of. Now, there is a little bit of an issue here, because now, uh, when, when we saw this formula previously, this was a finite graph, right? Now we have an infinite graph, which means that this is an infinite matrix. And the problem here is that like an infinite or this infinite matrix doesn't have a unique inverse. And, and in fact, the inverses, that's how we parameterize them. So for, for each x, y, we are actually given an inverse to this Kastlin matrix. Okay? And I will write down this, uh, this inverse because there is a formula for it. Um, maybe I need because I think this is I do like this. So what is the um, so to, to, uh, to, uh, to describe this inverse this uh, inverse here, uh, we consider the Kastli matrix on a torus. But let me first just write it down and then I will tell you what all these things are. Okay, so this is a big formula, but maybe right away you can see that this is the Fourier coefficient of some function inside here, right? So I will tell you what this function is. This is a function in Z and W, and to do that, we will, this is the, the, you can think about this as the casting matrix on the torus. 
okay? So what do I mean with that? So what you do in your, in your, uh, in your, in your graph, your, your square lattice, you take the, small, the, the fundamental domain, which is the smallest non-repeating part of your graph. So let's say, in this case, maybe, uh, maybe uh, k1 is equal to uh, 3 and k2 is equal to 2, let's say. Then, then um, the, the, weight function, the weights here are repeating after k steps in the, in the vertical directions. So, and, uh, and it uh, repeats after two steps in the horizontal direction. Uh, so, the fundamental domain would be something like this. Maybe one, two, three, so I guess it's uh, here. So this would be the fundamental domain uh, in this case. We take the fundamental domain and we embed it in the torus. So we simply say that like, okay, we only care about this part here and okay, we embed it in the torus in the way, in the sense, so we simply, is this correct? No. No, it's, it's not a, correct, right? One of them, the top down a little bit. I should have done here, right? Up, down, down, All right? Or, yeah, also works. I need uh, three blacks and three whites, so I, yeah, I think this should be correct, no? Um, so I simply say that like, uh, okay, uh, this one was called maybe W02, so I simply identified this and this vertex, so this is also W02. And the same here, so this was black 00, so then this would be not black 03, but instead black 00, right? And similar in this direction, yeah, you identify this vertex with this one, and so on and so forth, okay? And I introduce some, some, um, uh, uh, so I, uh, along this, the boundary of the fundamental domain, I consider the, uh, the curves gamma u and gamma v, and I introduce extra edge weights, or magnetically, uh, I'm magnetically altered, altering the edge weights by simply uh, saying that on the edges with, uh, which crosses gamma u, I multiply the edge weights with a z. Like this. And on the edges, crossing the uh, gamma v, I multiply the edge weight with w. So it would be a w, 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 and w, something like this. Okay? So now I can think about this as the, I mean, this is now a, weight, a weighting of the, of the torus, and this function Kg1 is the Castlin matrix of the torus. So it depends on, on the edge weights, but also on the, uh, on Z and W. So this would be still, so uh, how do I write this? So I consider this on some edge, w, uh, w comma b, that's sigma of w b times nu w b, and then you take z to the w b 
for gamma u and w. So with this, I simply mean we uh, we multiply it by z if, if uh, the edge wb crosses gamma u. Okay. Let me see the dice. Right, and the x and y, which runs over the real line, are only present here in the size of the, uh, the integrals, right? So we're integrating over uh, z over the circle. We integrate z over a circle of radius e to the x and w over a circle e to the y. Can x and y take any value in R2 or just a subset? Uh... So it can take a value in R2, anywhere in R2. But we will see what happens for different x and y. And it's not, we will see that uh, the, the integral or the, the inverse cast matrix is, for, it's not, uh, for some, uh, some x and y, it's the same. So it's not unique on in, the, in that way. Okay, so let us take an example just to make it a little bit more concrete. Let's take the easiest possible example. So if, you know, k1 is equal to 1 and k2 is equal to 2, so we have, so maybe example uh, uniform. So k1 is equal to 1 and k2 is equal to 2. So we consider the uniform uh, measure here. Um, then the fundamental domain is simply one edge like this. And I always need to be careful so, so the fundamental So this edge continues here, right? This edge should continue to this one, so I should take that to slightly bigger. This goes here, this goes, uh, I guess, here, like that. Something like this. So now the edge weights are 1 and 1 on this one. Let me choose the, the, the Kastlin sign to be minus 1 on this edge, just to take some Kastlin sign. And then on the ones crossing this, this line we put z, and on the lines crossing this one we put W. Okay. So then KG1 of Z comma W is something, okay, let us try to calculate this. So we get some contribution from, uh, so we take the contribution from going from along this edge one, which goes there and there, so that gives us a z. We take this edge, which gives us a one. We go along this edge, like this, which gives us a minus w. And then we go like this, along this edge, and that gives us a plus wz. Okay, so this matrix is in this case just a scalar, and has this form. Okay? Maybe I... Yeah, 
uh, maybe I also do a, is it clear or should I do a one larger example? I take that as I should do another example. <laughs> Uh, so uh, let us do an example where we have a slightly bigger graph, a two periodic. So k1 is equal to 2 and k2 is equal to 2. So uh, let me see how it looks like. Uh, so now the fundamental domain would be slightly bigger. So we have a black here, we have a black here, we have a white here, white here, black here, black here, and white here, and white here. Like this. And then they continue out. something like this. Something of that sort. And uh, let us again take the Kastlin sign to be, I think I usually take minus one on these types of edges. That was the same as I did here, right? So minus one here, minus one here, minus one here, and minus one here. Let us take some you know, simple choice of edge weights. Uh, so I introduce an, uh, maybe an A here, and an A inverse there, and also an A inverse here, and an A here. Just to have something so the fundamental domain is 2 times 2. Okay. So now this Kg1 of Z comma W, is a slightly larger matrix. So, so now we, so how you should think about this is that you, this is a matrix going from the black vertices to the white vertices. So you have B0, 0, zero here, B0, zero 1, B1, one 0, and B1, one, 1, and here, W0, 0, 0, W0, 1, W1, 0, W1, 1. So what is, what weight do we get between these two vertices? So that would be that and that vertex. And on that edge we only have one, right? And then we can look between that vertex, which is this, and this vertex, which would be that vertex. And you can see that this edge connects the two. So you get an A, A inverse here. And I forgot to include the Zs here. And Ws on this side. So uh, that one and that one gives us a Z times A inverse. And then that one towards that vertex gives us a W and then a minus one, so it's a minus W. That vertex to that vertex, you can go to through here, I think, up here, and that gives us a Z and a W. So it's a Z, W. And then we continue like this. So for B01 here, and this one, we get an A. Uh, from this to this one, we only have a 1, so it gives us a 1. From this down to this vertex, we get go here, here, I think. Is that correct? No, sorry. Here, here, uh, no, <laughs> sorry, here. Here it should be. So that gives us a W. And then finally from this to this one gives goes through W and then you have a minus one. So it's a minus one W. And then you continue. 
Is that clearer? Why is there four terms in the first zone? Because there are four ways to, to go between this vertex to this vertex in this very small fundamental domain. I think in, in first example, K2 is supposed to be one, right? Oh, yes, sorry, sorry. Yes, 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 yes. So this is the uniform in K and uh, K1 and K2 is one. So the result of Kenyon, this is a result for the square lattice or for general by this is uh, this this is a result for uh, general graphs, I think. General uh, by part of uh, like periodic graphs. Um, yes. There a minus sign on w? Where? Why is there a minus sign on w? Here. For like z plus one minus w. Because there is this comes from the Kastlin sign. Okay, so, so to understand this, this, uh, this measure, we need to invert one of these matrices, right? And then, then you have a double contour integral, and that, uh, yeah, that's the measure you have, okay? Um, and one interesting thing which you can see from this formula is that this is a, this is a type of a Fourier coefficient, right, of this, this function. And, the, and this m and n is, captures the distance between the vertices or the edges we're looking at. So the behavior of, of this, um, uh, of uh, the correlations between edges are captured or depends on the smoothness of this function. And I mean, this is a rational function, which is smooth, except when you have zeros, right? So it's very interesting, I mean, to understand uh, the correlation between edges, we need to understand when is this, uh, this, uh, when is this uh, not invertible, right? And that leads us to the characteristic polynomial and the spectral curve. So, um, And their amoebas is a very good way of uh, like thinking about these spectral curves. So what is this, the, the characteristic polynomial? Uh, that's the polynomial, or that's the determinant of this, this Kastli matrix on the torus. So the, the characteristic polynomial is given by P of ZW is equal to the determinant of G1 of Z comma W. So, I mean, because, and now you see that, like, the zero set of this guy capture, I mean, exactly when this, uh, the, uh, this one is not invertible. And therefore, we are interested in the spectral curve. is the zero set in C squared such that the polynomial for, for which the polynomials are zero. Like this. And, okay, I will tell you a little bit more about uh, these polynomials, but it's like to understand this 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 curve. It's very good. It's a very 
um, useful to consider its amoeba. Uh, so what is the amoeba? Uh, so the amoeba is the image in R2 of the spectral curve under the map, under the log map which takes the logarithm, so the log map takes z comma w, so points, uh, yeah, points in the spectral curve now to the logarithm of the absolute value of z comma the logarithm of the absolute value of w. So that's the, uh, that's the, that's the amoeba. Okay, so let's, let us go to, back to these examples. So the, uh, the characteristic polynomial here is, I mean, in this case, uh, this is simply, I mean, this is just a scalar, so that's the same thing, right? And the characteristic polynomial, uh, the spectral curve, is, uh, I mean, you can simply compute what, uh, like, the relation between uh, z, uh, w, z and w, and I think here you get the w, so spectral curve, uh, w should be equal to, uh, I guess, uh, z plus 1 divided by uh, 1 minus z, maybe like this. And now the amoeba in this case, I will just draw it for you, will look like this. So the amoeba is the interior here. And Okay, maybe you cannot see that right away, but at least you can see that, you know, so this is, I mean, this is the image, right, under this log of z. So we have x comma y in, in R2 here is log of z comma log of absolute w. So here you get these asymptotes, right, when, when z tends to zero. That's when we get this asymptote, when z goes to infinity, you get an asymptote in the other direction. When w goes to zero, that's exactly when z is equal to minus one, I guess. Um, then you get, right, then you get an asymptote like this. And when z, w goes to infinity, that's when z is equal to 1, which, and that, uh, you get that asymptote here. So z is equal to 1 and minus 1. In this picture, it's simply the, uh, I mean, x is equal to 0. Right? In, the, in this example, we will get something similar, so the, you get still something looking like this. Okay, I mean, you can also compute this, uh, the po characteristic polynomial here. It's a long mess, I will not do that. Um, but, but you can do it and, you know, plug that into a computer if you want to, and then you see that you get a similar shape, but you get also like a hole inside in the interior. Okay. These are the amoebas. And maybe I should just say, I will not like write it down, but generically, for in the setting of the square lattice, the characteristic polynomial 
is a polynomial of degree k1 in the variable z. It's a polynomial in degree of degree k2 in the variable w. And here it will have an, so, which, okay, yeah. It, it will have a shape looking like this. So maybe I will draw a little bit. A number of tentacles like this. And a number of hole inside. And these number of tentacles will be K1. And the number of tentacles here will be K2. And the number of holes will be, um, will be K1 minus 1 times K2 minus 2. So that's the number of holes. Okay, I said I would not write it down, but now I did anyway. Um, so that's the generic uh, setting. So you can kind of understand this, this, uh, these objects. Okay. And why are these objects good to look at? Well, it's another theorem of the same guys in the same paper. Maybe I should not have done that. Yeah, I think it's fine. Um, and they state, they show that these characteristic polynomials are so-called HANA curves. No, the spectral curve. Or, is a HANA curve. And, okay, there are different ways of defining what the, uh, what the HANA curve is, but what I want to say here is that the HANA curve, one characterization, the curve, is Honak if the map, if the log map is uh, 2 to 1 in the interior of the amoeba. Okay, so what does that mean? It simply means that we can think about this characteristic polynomial, uh, sorry, the, uh, the spectral curve by taking two copies of the amoeba and glue them together along their boundaries. And that gives you your spectral curve. So you can think about this as like, you know, some surface, you know, The two copies are glued together along their, uh, the boundaries, and that gives you your spectral curve. Okay, and why do I talk about this? Well, it's going back to, to this one, right? Because this shows that the amoeba gives us a phase diagram of the behavior of this, uh, this measure here, or the measure I erased. Sorry, that was bad. So what I mean with that, so if in this, this uh, you can, if xy is in the interior, of the amoeba, so let's, let us have a, 
an amoeba here. So if we are somewhere in the interior, then that means that uh, this, uh, this object is, uh, I mean, uh, it's singular, so it's uh, on the curves, which means, and you can then show that the decay between, between edge, uh, edges uh, decay polynomially. If, let us include a hole here in the middle, so if x, so, y... Can you explain what you mean? So x and y here are points, uh, what, what are they, sorry? So, right, so if x, y... Maybe I just cannot see, sorry. Say again? Maybe I just cannot see what's... Yeah, sorry, that might have been a bit small. So, so if he, this is x, this is y. This is the set which parameterizes this measure here. So if x, so if, uh, so if we're integrating z and w over curves of radius e to the x and e to the y, then that means... You know, I'm sorry, you can also say, uh, because we live in a torus, uh, if you map dimers to a non-intersecting paths, then x and y parameterize the slopes in one and the other direction, the paths. Uh, that's also tr true, yes? Maybe this explains a little bit. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, you can, uh, yeah, I mean, that's another way to, to think about this, that you, you map it to slopes and then you look at the slopes in the Newton polygon and so on, but that's not really the story I'm, I'm telling here, right? So what I'm trying to say is that if X and Y are in the interior of the amoeba here, that then Z and W are points where the, the, this matrix is not invertible. And that means that this, this, uh, this function here is singular on these curves. And you don't have like a very nice decay when M and N increases. While if X and Y is in, in the in a bounded component of the complement, of the amoeba, so we are somewhere in here, then on these curves, this guy is invertible everywhere. So this is just a rational function, and this is a smooth function in particular. So when m and n increases, which, is, which we need to do to look at the edge-edge correlation when, uh, when the edge-edge uh, correlations increase, the distance between edges increases, then this is a smooth function, and the Fourier coefficients of a smooth function decay rapidly. It's decay exponentially. And the third case, sorry, now you cannot see anymore, I think. So I should, I maybe I write the third case here. So the third case is if we are outside, if X and Y are a outside the amoeba.
uh, then you can kind of see, okay, it's, but then you also, this is invertible and we have a smooth thing here, but you can also like move your contours like how far you want. So like all, it becomes like, um, it's not just uh, decaying, it's really like zero or fixed zero in some sense. So uh, the, the, uh, so the randomness disappears, kind of. Just can you remind me what are x and y in terms of the original value model we were considering? So I think it's in your notation, but I just can't quite make it. Yeah. So so yeah, I was I removed that. That was an unfortunate uh, way. So x and y. So so we are looking at uh, like all kind of um, of. Um, ergodic translation invariant Gibbs measures. And I mean, okay, uh, and there is not just one. So like we want to, yeah, it was unfortunate that I removed it, but like the inverse Castlin matrix here is not unique anymore. And all possible uh, inverse Castlin matrices can be uh, characterized by, by X and Y and Z. And as Leo told you, this can be translated into like the slope of the of the of the um, uh, diamond configuration. Um, so that's one way to think about it as well. But you need that's a map. It's not direct x and y is not the slopes. You have to you need to uh, yeah. Uh, Complement of the amoeba, uh, the randomness. Uh, uh, there is no randomness. I don't know. Okay, and so, so this case, the first case, edge-edge correlation, the case polynomially, is what we usually call. Uh, the um, liquid region, right? So this is the liquid region. A liquid region or sometimes also rough region. The edge-edge correlation decay exponentially is, um, is what we usually call the gas region or smooth region. So this corresponds to the gas region or smooth. And this last one uh, corresponds to the frozen region. Frozen region. So these, these translation invariant Gibbs measures are you know, they are like, um, they're parameterized by points in R2, but dependent on the location, you get, you are either, it either corresponds to the liquid region, the gas region, or the frozen region. And this is captured by the amoeba. This is uh, uh, the phase diagram of this is in the amoeba. Yes. If you're on the boundary of the amoeba, does it count as a, a gas in the I think my memory tells me says, but maybe someone could should correct me. But I think the boundary is also in the the boundary here. I think is in the gas, and the boundary here should be in the frozen. Then, but that seems weird to me. I, so I'm a little bit. I'm not completely sure. Do you know? I think it's uh, frozen and gas. Only. Yeah. So. Probably, but uh, on the boundary here, you see the see the um, uh, frozen region, and on the boundary here, you see uh, gas region. Yeah, that's correct. It's also memory, but it is uh, the singular. Um, it is singular. Um, okay. Yeah. So you need to be a bit careful uh, on the boundary. Um, yeah, and I, I cannot, yeah, I, I agree, uh, but I, I cannot, 
I cannot tell you how, how to think about the boundary, really. Just to be clear on three, it's unbounded rather than bounded. Frozen. Oh yeah, sorry, sorry. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Okay, uh, I was not really preparing this in uh, because I was planning to do a steepest descent analysis of the of the Aztec diamond, and in fifteen minutes that will not really be possible, I think. Um, But maybe I start and then, uh, you know, <laughs> it's, we'll see. Okay, that's... And, yeah, okay, so let me be, uh, be a little bit quicker and then, I mean, it's soon five, so, you know, no hard feelings if it's time to go home and so on. But let me try to, to do a little bit about this. Okay, so, 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 I mean, I, I told you from the beginning that I wanted to tell you how do you, like, you know, take the limit when n tends to infinity, right? And as, as Cedric told you the other day or yesterday, one way to capture, uh, cor like, um, uh, correlations is by the inverse Kastlin matrix of the, uh, of the Aztec diamond. And for, I mean, and that's a great theorem, right? But the problem is that typically you don't have a nice formula for this, this object. In the case of the Aztec diamond, you actually have a formula for the inverse Kastlin matrix. So the inverse Kastlin matrix of Bij Wi prime K prime this is given by the indicator function of i greater than i prime divided by 2 pi i, the integral of gamma of w i minus i prime divided by z j minus j prime dz over z plus 1 plus 1 over 2 pi i squared gamma 1, gamma 2, z2 minus 1 to the n, z1 minus 1 to the n, w2i divided by w1i prime, c1j prime divided by z2j, z1, z2, z1 minus 1, dz2, dz1 divided by z2 minus z1. Okay, this is like, you know, a rather big formula, but it's actually not too bad. So the relation between w and z is by the characteristic polynomial. So this gives you the relation between z and w. Um, so, okay, I will not tell you really how to obtain this. I mean, as we said, we are short of time anyway. But like, there are many ways of obtaining this formula. And one is like by non-intersecting path, as you have seen, which has appeared a number of times. And yeah, you can actually obtain like the correlation kernel using uh, lindstrom gessel vino and then Enameta theorem and maybe use some orthogonal polynomial or toplitz matrices and so on. And with some integrable techniques, you can obtain this formula. When you have the formula, you can check it directly, right? Because it's the inverse of a matrix. So now you just hit your, uh, your Kastlin matrix from the left and see that you actually get the identity back. That's a way to check it. Let us, for simplicity, I, you know, I mean, maybe you want to, I mean, one goal would be to say, like, okay, let us now zoom in somewhere in the Aztec diamond, take the limit of this guy, and show that the limit is exactly this guy, right? That's one way of doing it. In the special case 
of G1 being this polynomial. Let us be a little bit more modest for the time of, uh, sake of time and simply con uh, look at the, uh, at the edge probability that an edge lies in a diamond configuration and for, and I will take this edge. So I will take a, uh, an edge of this type and say what's the probability as n tends to infinity that that lies in the in the uh, in a diamond configuration. So if you do that from the formula we saw yesterday, this is k inverse. evaluated at Bia and Wij. And if I plug this into this formula here, this is equal to 1 over 2 pi i squared of gamma 1 integral of gamma 2 of z1 minus 1 to the n z2 uh, C2, C1 minus 1 to the n, W2i, Zi1, J, I, Um, and we're zooming in somewhere here, right? So we say that i j, which is the location we are zooming in at, we we simply denote that by u n comma v n. So n here is the size of the Aztec diamond. Okay? Otherwise, if we don't scale i and j with n, we will simply end up somewhere at the boundary when n increases, right? If i and j is fixed. And you can actually write this one. Okay, this will be so what is what you do when you have this type of, of uh, um, double contour integral? Well, you try to write it on a form of the, of the following form. like this. And in this case, this function s is expressed in this w, z, and z, uh, z minus 1. So our s here is v times log of z minus u log of w minus log of z minus 1. So this is the object we are looking at here. And the idea when you do a steepest descent analysis, I mean in five minutes I will be very brief I guess, is that you look at the critical points here. And I will 
try to have time to explain a little bit why. But if we just do that in this example, you look at, you know, you take the derivative of z and look at the critical points, right? That's an that's a exercise you can do. If you do that, you get something like this, if I did the computation correctly. And one thing you can see without knowing anything of steepest descent analysis, only looking at like, okay, I told you that we need to look at, at, um, at uh, the critical points. One thing that you can see is that we get two critical points, right? Something over here, and then I have put the plus and minus this guy, right? And we have something, the square root of something here, and that uh, and this might be positive or negative. And if you look carefully, this, if you look at the Aztec diamond here, if you are inside, I mean, this, this is really, I mean, the boundary, th this is negative exactly inside the circle, which is precisely this, this circle here interior. And it's something real when it's outside this circle. Right? Um, yeah, and maybe I should, so, yeah, so maybe I will, will not continue the entire thing here, but like now you can, if you have seen steepest descent analysis, the idea is that you deform contours, which I haven't even told you about. Um, so they cross this point, and this is the point, this is the location where this integral is as large as possible, so you can understand it on these points and in that way take a limit. But what I want to, since I didn't have time to go through the entire thing, is that just looking at the critical points, this arctic curve, these circles appear very naturally, right? It's just whatever you have under your, the square root. And the complex, uh, the complex valued critical points corresponds to you are in the liquid region, and the real critical points corresponds to the frozen regions. Okay, sorry for the, for the quick, and, but uh, yeah, thank you.